Greetings, I'm Anne Marie Kelly, and I'm glad you joined me today for Not Your Mother's Marriage. I'm inviting you to come on a new adventure with me, one that will shift the way that you think about marriage and show you a whole new way to do I do, a better way to do I do. It's called The Five-Year Marriage, and it's really not your mother's marriage. And today we're talking about partners. Fabulous Helen Muir once said, the great marriages are partnerships. It can't be a great marriage without a partnership. An actor, Rob Lowe, once talked about, he compared marriage to movies. And the same thing that makes a good marriage is what makes a good movie. It's all about the casting. It's all about the per person that you choose. What kind of partner is, your, is the partner that will be your right partner? The truth is that it's hard to know what that is. Because you know what? There are no perfect partners. That's why there's no perfect marriages, because everybody's different, everybody's finding their own way, and everybody's evolving, which is one of the benefits of the five-year marriage, because you can rethink your agreements as you get towards that five-year mark. But in order to have even a five-year, a good five-year marriage, you need to pick the right partner. Today I've invited Today, I've invited lifestyle coach Allie Roberts to join us today. She has an interesting experience with relationships and marriages. I thought she'd be a good one to have a chat with. Welcome, Allie. Thank you, Anne Marie, for having me. You know, Allie, I talk about the I, I talk about a criteria for marriage, and and I call it the solid seven. Okay. It's about emotional chemistry, which you know we kind of know how that is. Right. That's pretty easy to figure out. Physical and emotional chemistry easy is usually to figure, figure out. out. Um, ongoing dialogue, having that conversation, being able to talk to somebody and, and get an answer. You know, sometimes you can talk at somebody, but ongoing dialogue is a back and forth. And it's about being dependable. When somebody says they're going to do it, they actually do it. Right. Um, accepting personal responsibility. You know, you probably have met people that, that when something happens, it's never their fault. It's always somebody else's fault. I think that's a big fault. one. Yeah, personal so, responsibility yeah. and the ongoing dialogue, which I think takes time to learn. And because we've already had a little bit of a conversation, I know freedom is really an important thing. Yes. And I th that that freedom to be who you really are. Yes. Is so critical. Don't you think sometimes when people get in relationships, they want to be that facade? That the, you know that facade that makes the person ask them out. I and think a lot of people put up who they think they need to be, and you have to be who you are from the beginning. Otherwise, you're showing somebody you're somebody else, and then all of a sudden, you want to be yourself, and you don't know how to do that. And they're and, they, and, then and it's not do, fair to them. Yeah, and, and if you do start being yourself, they're like, "Who are you?" That's why I always say, first dates, wear your pajamas." <laughs> That's a good one. Wear your pajamas yeah. and no makeup and just say, this is who I am, let's go from here. <laughs> so that idea of having the freedom to be who you really are and then being fair. I remember in my relationship, one of the things I always thought about was whether it was food, food on a plate or responsibilities or a workload, I always tried to make sure that, that we both had the same amount. Mm -hmm. So it was like being fair. And, and then the other thing is having mutual respect. You know, those, uh, th those solid seven things are so important they for everybody. They seem like they should be so easy to do, they and they are not easy to do. Yeah, they should be really easy. Maybe number one. Yeah, the emotional intimacy emotional or the intimacy physical. or connection, chemistry. You know right away if you feel something or you don't, if you're attracted or you're not. And I think other than that, the other six, it takes time. And you have to know what you want going into it. And I don't think people do. That's, you know, and that's one of the things I tell people. It's like, know what you want. Right. Because if you, don't know, if you don't know what you want, you don't know how to do it. Right. In, or you don't have the rest of the pieces right. until you know what that is. Uh, and one of the things, too, it's people often get that intimacy, that chemistry confused with sexual relationship or sexual chemistry. Well, I think in the, with my experience, with myself and with clients, I think it's lust. There's that, I want passion, I want romance, I want movie sex, I want... And so that physical chemistry from the beginning is, there's a lust that goes 
but where do you want that to go? Because that's going to fade away, and you have to want it to grow into something, and all those other six components play into that. Yeah, I always say that the lust gets colder, it gets cold, and the, and the luster tarnishes a little yes. bit. And if you don't have something else going on, right. that right. there's a problem. But nobody can deny that that first piece with all that lust at the front, sure. it's delicious. Like of when I see a couple it is. Like that, I'm like, oh, that's you're in the delicious part it of your is. relationship. It is. I agree with you, and that's a good word for it. It is delicious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like, but it's kind of the thing that everybody really enjoys. Yes. But tell us a little bit about your story because you have multiple relationships, <laughs> and, and it is the reason why I wanted you to come on today because that's true. because yeah. you see it from both sides in an I interesting do. way. I do. I have been married and divorced twice. Um, and then after my second divorce, I met somebody online. I did the online thing that everyone said I should do, and I met somebody. And it was a long-term relationship, um, which I definitely thought was going to be my final relationship of life, um, until it wasn't. And when I came out of those big ones, the last, the last one shifted a lot for me, both mentally and physically. And I decided I was going to go on an inner journey for a while. So I needed to transform how I saw relationships. What did they mean to me? What did I want? What did I not want? And most important for me was personal responsibility. Hmm. It took two of us to make the marriage. And sometimes it looks like it takes, you know, one person broke the marriage. But for me, I needed to break open and get really raw with myself and say, where was my responsibility yeah. in breaking this marriage? Yeah. What did I do wrong? Because if I don't figure that out, I can't have another successful relationship. It's impossible. You, you know, Allie, that's, that is such a good point because I see that a lot. I see that a lot when mm -hmm. somebody has multiple relationships, whether they're marriage or not, that they go out with and marry the same person. Mm -hmm. Because, it, I mean, they may look different, you know, but, but right. it's the same person. Did you find that in your relationship? No, I didn't. Um, my first husband and my second husband were very different people. Ironically, though, they did resemble each other. And not many people, my, my first husband lives out west, and so not many people had actually m met him from my circle once I was divorced and made new friends. Um, but when they, people saw my second husband, they said, did, did you marry your husband's brother? Because oh people thought that oh, they, they resembled each other. They had a physical resemblance, um, but they were very different people. Very, very, very different. And my third relationship was a lot like my first. So I kind of went back to this rebel, bad boy hmm. kind of thing that I thought was exciting. What is it about us, like in the bad boys? We, we do. We, we think just, it's exciting. There's yeah. a little bit of sweet and a little bit of salty, and, and I know that's what drives me, you know? I like a little bit of edge, and um, the key is to find the edge that's not painful. That's right. <laughs> you don't that's cut right. yourself off. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> So it's, tell me what kinds of things, as you progressed through those relationships, mm -hmm. what kinds of things did you think that you would have asked or thought about differently going into the relationship? I, uh, parenting. In both my marriages, I wish that I had discussed parenting. My first marriage, you know, we were having a child together, and... I don't think we ever discussed how we would parent. And we came from two different backgrounds, two religion differences. So we did not discuss it. And after my daughter was born, we didn't really discuss it either. It was kind of an assumption of we're just going to do this. But we got, we separated almost immediately after she was born. And I ended up raising her and having sole physical custody. So I got to do it on my own. But when years later, when I married my second husband, we blended two families together. Hmm. And we didn't talk about it. And I didn't bring it up either. I didn't even think about it at the time. And there was a great difference in how we raised our children. And it hurt the marriage. I can, I, I've seen that happen. It I, hurt the marriage. Unfortunately, I've seen that happen. And the other thing that I've seen happen is that they want to have a family. 
they can have a family for whatever, you know, whatever's going on. So one person says, well, I really want to be a parent. I want to adopt or I want to do artificial insemination or something. Mm -hmm. And the other partner's like, no, no, no way. You know, I think. and if it can't be my biological child, mm -hmm. or there's like a whole bunch of things that may or may not make sense right. to other people, but make sense to that the, peop the partners in that couple. Sure, and even in my third relationship, where my daughter was already get, becoming a teenager and his kids were a little bit older, I didn't think that question needed to be asked. But as it got more serious and I thought, I, I could marry this man one day. And even though our kids will be grown, the, our view on parenting was drastically different. And that was a problem. It, it, we, yeah. it, we didn't parent each other's children, but our beliefs in parenting were different. So that is a question I would have asked going into it if I, if I were to go backwards. Sure. When you cut, because when you're coming up to get, like coming up, you come up in two separately different homes. Oh, absolutely. Whether it's a separate religion or not. I know in my relationship, yeah. we, both of us kind of came from crazy, but they were two different kinds of crazy. Yeah. Sure. And you know, your your psyche is set by the time you're two or three years old. Absolutely. So you sort of move You are forward. programmed to go, yeah. Yeah. you know, and that's it. Your programming makes your beliefs, your beliefs make your identity. It sort of makes it seem crazy that two people with from two different backgrounds would come together and then they're supposed to live together till death. You know, it makes no sense. Makes no it sense. It was how I. It, it was why the, I created the five-year marriage because that fabulous. made no sense to me. Right. And uh, and and you told me a story about before your first marriage that you had a feeling that it wasn't the right thing. To I do. did. I did. I. Um, <laughs> we were living out west, and I. Both of us were from here, from the east. Um, and my mother got this lovely woman who was going to dress me for my wedding. And when she put me in the dress, and I walked down these stairs of the restaurant to go into the ceremony, and the veil was dropped over, and I got to the bottom step, and my mother looked at me, and my friend came around who was trying to line the procession, and she said, it's time. And I went, and I couldn't let my breath out. It got stuck. And my mother <laughs> lifted my veil and smacked me across the face, and she said, let's go. And I kind of shook out of it, and I had this flutter and rush in my chest of, oh my God, what am I doing? Because I knew, I knew this marriage was going to fail because I saw the signs, and I knew there was no way that we would survive it. But at the same time, I was young, I was 28 years old, and I, my mom, you know, she, she paid for a wedding, and I didn't she was a single mom. She was, and took a loan out for my wedding. Mm -hmm. And I was afraid to let her down. I was afraid to walk up there in front of all those people and say, I can't do this. So I did it. Did you ever ask her after the fact, did, what, was she glad you did it or not, would she, how she would have reacted if you I had I never stopped? asked her. I never asked her what would have happened if I had said, Mama, I can't. But it's easy for me to look back today, all these years later, my daughter's 19 and in college, and I wouldn't have her if I didn't marry him. And many, many women say that. That's if there was no other reason for that marriage. There's no other reason than I got my gift. And, you know, today, you know, he's been married a few times and he's very happy. And he, he and my daughter have a great relationship from afar. And we get along fine. The past is the past on that one. How do you think using the five-year marriage would have made a difference as you went into the marriage or while you were in the marriage? I don't think... In because your first marriage didn't, didn't even get as far as five years. No, and I don't think it would have mattered. I don't think the, the five-year marriage would have mattered in that situation. I think it was, it was destined to not work. I, I just don't think it would have worked. However, I think maybe it it would have made a difference in my second marriage. I think if we had this contract, if we had laid things out before, which is, you know, what will we do if we get into this situation? What will we do if the kids do this or this? Whether they're yours or mine, they've become ours. 
and we had we we needed unity there and we didn't have it and i think if there had been a guideline that we put together maybe it would have helped yeah so you i do think, actually think that so do you th so but you don't think going into that first marriage if you had done all of that in advance of that first marriage that you would have said wait a minute this isn't right for us no. we shouldn't get married i don't think it would have worked with that partner what what wouldn't have worked i don't think Based on the personalities, I think that we could have gone into it with a five-year marriage contract of some sort. We could have, but I don't think it would have been followed. Okay. I just don't. Yeah, you, and you know what, Allie, I, and I tell people all this time, the five-year marriage isn't for everybody because some people need, there's a bunch of reasons why yeah. they need it, but they need not to have that deadline or right. moat. They don't want to be motivated to have an ending or anything like that. And I get that, but in this situation, I just think that um, sometimes, you you know, we can control what we do. We can't control the other person and what they want and what they do, and I don't think it would have worked in that situation. And you don't think it would have flipped your mind to say maybe this isn't the right person? To be honest, I have to say I, 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 don't, even, I don't even go down that road because because I have my daughter with that one. And I, I don't want to think if it would have been different. Okay. Yeah. I, because because my, my thinking about it is if you do that and then you say, huh, I, you know. Right. And if I had done that and I had realized I was making a mistake and I didn't want to go into it, I'd be in a different situation. So with that particular marriage, I, I just say I got what I was supposed to get. So... What are some of the big things that you, if, you are, if you were coaching a, a couple, mm -hmm. what would be some of the things that you would be telling them? I, um, I would say to them, I would sit them down and I would say, I would like to see both of you individually lay out your goals. What are your, each of your goals for marriage? What are your goals for parenting? What are your goals personally, professionally, financially? Where is your connection to something? And then I would want them to do it together. Because I think each person individually has to have their plan themselves. You cannot rely on the other partner to bring you fulfillment and joy and happiness. You get that together, but you have to come into it first with that. Because without it, you are relying on another person to fill you up day after day. One, it's, it's not sustainable. And two, the other person can't take on that kind of pressure. Um, I think parenting is a huge factor that people should talk about before they get married. How do they want to raise children? What are their beliefs? What would they do if a situation arose? Because when you're in it, you don't have time for that. And it causes a lot of trouble in a marriage if you aren't on the same page. Not only for a marriage, but for the children. Yeah, I, they I are the ultimate ones that, yep. that, that get hurt in the end. Yep. You know, and, and also, very importantly, I would say, you have to make a pact, a contract, sign a paper. When we fight, it is never going to be in front of the children. Even if it's a horrible situation that we feel like we're going to lose control, remember that. Find a safe word. <laughs> do something, but don't ever do it in front of your kids because everything our kids hear, everything our kids watch is what programs, it programs them. It gives them their beliefs at such a young age. They grow up with those. And, and then what? It's one of the things in the five-year marriage that, that I recommend, and I, and I show couples how to have a family meeting. And sometimes, and in my marriage, sometimes we have to have family meetings every week. Sometimes we can go a couple of months. It depends on what's going on. Mm -hmm. But if, you, if at some point you're having family meetings and the, the whole point is to stay on the same page. Yes. But as the children get old enough, that you start to bring them into the family meeting. Yes. Because it's important for, I, I think that it's important for children to see that it doesn't just happen like magic. No. Nothing happens no. in marriage by magic. It's, no. it, it's a negotiation. It is a negotiation, and yes. sometimes they're painful. Yes, but it's okay to show your kids that, and it's okay that they know you argue as long as they know you walk away from it with love. Right. And always give them an opportunity to voice their own concerns. Don't shut them down. Let them be a part of this. You made them, yeah. you made this family yeah. give the opportunity to grow as a family. 
Somebody once said they thought that the five-year marriage was terrible because of what it did for the children. But the truth of the matter is, if the kids can't see how the cake is made, they don't know how to make a cake when they get in their own relationship. I always relationship. say the same thing. If yeah. you don't show kids, you know, I know people who say, well, we're staying in this marriage until the kids go off to school, to college, or until we are in this phase. And I say, then what are your kids learning from you? That's a exactly loveless right. yep. relationship. You are teaching your daughters to not be respected and to not have love, and you're teaching your sons that it's okay to not love back. Don't do it. Your kids are more resilient than you give them credit for, yep. and if you explain a situation and you show them that it's within love and that they'll always be supported, give them a chance to see something good. That's It's really true, and, and for all of the couples that I've worked with and for so many who are children of divorce, that when I ask them, you know, did they, because sometimes women will say, well, the kids didn't even know we were having a problem. They knew. Yes, they did. Kids know. They're in the they same house. Know. They know. It's, sometimes it's it, not a sound, it's a feeling. Children can feel the stress. There's a tension in the air, and everybody feels it. Yep. Even your and then they grow it. up with that tension. I know. Yeah. yeah. Allie, this was good. It was good to have the conversation thank with you. I'm glad thank that you, you came in. Thank you so much in. for having me. And I'm glad that, I'm glad I did. And um, thank you for all for joining me today. If you want to know more about the five-year marriage, you can find me at fiveyearmarriage.com. And Allie, how can people get in touch with you? People can get in touch with me um, at Real Health MD. We're located in King of Prussia. You can look us up and find me there. You Please. can find me also on Allie Strong Coaching on Instagram and Facebook. And I hope you'll join me again for Not Your Mother's Marriage. Chen's on.